right. Uh, well, I appreciate uh, everyone being here, devoting a couple of days uh, to come uh, and be a part of this conference here at Southeastern. Uh, my name is Brad Hambrick. Uh, I serve a lot of different roles, depending on where you see me determines what hat I am wearing. Uh, sometimes I am the pastor of counseling at the Summit Church. Uh, sometimes I am assistant professor of counseling here at Southeastern Seminary. Uh, sometimes I am a middle school or travel baseball coach, uh, and so I can wear a variety of hats. Um, but uh, the hat that I'm wearing today is one of my counseling hats, uh, and we're going to be trying to think well about the subject of gender and sexuality, uh, which, um, if you pay attention in many circles, uh, it's a conversation that it can get heated fast. Uh, it can feel like you're not allowed to ask questions fast. Um, that you're supposed to already know what the right answer is and be lined up with that answer from the beginning. And depending on who you talk to, that right answer can change quickly. Um, and so this is one of those conversations that doesn't feel like a conversation, it can often feel like a monologue. Um, one of my goals um, is just to make this feel like a safe topic to interact with, uh, to give us some handles and categories uh, that when a conversation gets dicey, we can figure out what's going on, what are the two or three different conversations that are getting meshed into one um, so I have a better idea for where this person who may see things differently than I do or is just raising a different question than I am, I've got a little better idea um, of how I can effectively and fruitfully engage with them. So uh, since we are at an academic environment, I thought an outline would be helpful. Uh, I thought Roman numerals uh, would give you a sense that you are having a full academic experience. Uh, so if you are somebody who really wants to take notes because note taking is important to you, uh, then this is what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about just what's the audience and objective for what we're talking about here. Uh, then we'll move into, you kind of have this initial train of LGBT. Um, not all of those initials fit with the other initials well. Uh, some of the uh, reasoning uh, behind uh, argumentation that comes with each can be a bit different. Uh, so we're going to pick one. Uh, that's going to be the primary angle that we work from. If it's not the initial that you most wanted to talk about uh, when you came here, uh, I am sorry for that. It's not that we will neglect the other initials. We'll just, uh, we'll need to pick one to have some focus to the conversation. And then uh, we'll talk about three lenses um, that uh, you have probably had the experience um, of having two different conversations about the same subject it's like we're both talking about the same thing. We're not talking about it the same way. I can't figure out why we can't have a productive conversation. Um, if you haven't had that experience, you will at some point in your life. Um, that's what this part right here is. Uh, a couple of goals uh, that I would have for us uh, towards the end of that. So um, when it comes to audience and objective, uh, I I guess it was a few years ago. Uh, I wrote a book, uh, Do Ask, Do Tell, Let's Talk, uh, Why and How Christians Should Have Gay Friends. Um, and um, if you ask me, uh, Brad, why would you write a book like that? Um, the simple answer is I got asked to write a book like that. Um, it, um, there would be individuals who uh, would come to me in my role for counseling. Uh, they uh, experienced unwanted same-sex attraction. They didn't feel like they could talk to anybody. Uh, to have a conversation where 
can I just have a conversation and not have to pick a political party? Can I have a conversation and be a little lost and confused and not be either a heretic or a fundamentalist? And they appreciated the conversation. And for a period of time, um, that was enough. And then counseling at most is an hour a week. And there's 167 other hours you got to get through. Um, and individuals would say, you know, I... It's nice to be able to come and talk about my life and sort things out and figure out uh, how to honor God with an experience that I don't really want and I didn't choose and I didn't ask for, but I'm stuck with it. I don't feel like there's a lot of other Christians out there that I can have this kind of conversation with. And so uh, the audience uh, for uh, those initials do ask, do tell, let's talk for uh, that particular book, for this presentation. Um, it's not a platform to platform audience that I'm talking to. Um, that if you take the people who stand on a platform because whatever side of this issue they take is the most important thing to them, it would be my argument they are not representative of the genu general population. If you observe the person who is doing the stump peach at a gay pride rally, that person is not representative of the general gay population. If you take the person who is most passionate about standing up in the name of Christianity and just making the strongest possible points, you might find that they are not representative of the average Christian in the pew. And when the individual who is hurting, struggling, and confused just looks to the loudest voice on either side, it says, what am I supposed to do? Um, man, that feels unfair. Who will just talk to me? Who can I have a conversation with? And so, uh, audience, um, is that. Um, that uh, the intent uh, is not that you leave here and you can preach the best sermon ever on gender and sexuality to a room full of people. Um, but that if you had a hurting friend, a fellow student, uh, a student in your student ministry, somebody in your college ministry, a friend from work, and they said, hey, I haven't talked about this before. You seem like a reasonable person. Can we talk? That's the conversation. I don't want to set you up to win a debate. Uh, I hope you leave here going, I got some handles that I can enter into uh, a conversation well. It's not that there aren't a place for debates and that kind of thing, but uh, I'm a counselor. That's my background. It's what I do. Uh, counselors don't really do debates. Uh, we can't argue people into doing anything, um, yet we have conversations. Um, so uh, I offer you what I have uh, from what I do. Um, in terms of initials, um, that um, for today we're going to predominantly focus uh, on the T uh, in LGBT. <coughs> I know you can put the plus on the end of it, and there's, uh, you know, an ever-growing number of initials that come there. Um, but uh, discussing transgenderism, gender dysphoria, uh, more than um, homosexuality, same-sex attraction, uh, gay identity. Not that we won't delve into some of those subjects, um, but um, 
I think it is interesting and somewhat beneficial uh, to understand some of the differences in argumentation uh, that exist based upon which initial is being discussed. Uh, and so uh, with uh, lesbian, gay, or bi, uh, the argument tends to be, I was born this way. Biology is right. Uh, the, um, the argument for T is I was born wrong. Uh, and so the argument in LGB uh, is very pro and elevated biology. Uh, in T, uh, the argument is no. It, uh, I feel like a man trapped in a woman's body. I feel like a woman trapped in a man's body. Um, biology got it wrong. And so uh, that, again, if we're talking with a friend, um, gotcha lines get you nowhere when you're talking with a friend. If you're talking to an audience and that audience uh, is predisposed to agree with whatever you have to say and you come with a gotcha line, it will get you applause and laughter. If you're trying to win a debate and everybody's got a clicker, whether they like or don't like what you're doing, gotcha lines will move the clicker. Gotcha lines in a conversation with a friend who's being vulnerable with you will absolutely shut the conversation down and go, ah, this was a mistake. I should have known better than to talk. And so that... It doesn't mean that it's not helpful to know those things, um, but um, nobody's going to say, ah, you mean we have an inconsistent argument regarding uh, the validity of biology? I must not be experiencing what I thought I was. Um, oh, wait, there's a sampling bias in twin studies that would say this science is not as um, empirically valid as it would seem to be. Ah, bad twin studies. I don't experience anything. Um, yeah, I think it's helpful um, to be able to say, okay, how do we engage well with the science? Um, we need to know enough about uh, the way that you do empirical research that we can look at the sampling biases that exist in twin studies and say, how strong is this science? Um, but in a conversation with a friend, uh, debunking a twin study doesn't get us very far. Um, so uh, that's why um, this right here uh, is where, um, where I would like for us to spend uh, the majority of our time in thinking through uh, three sets of lenses. Uh, Mark Yarhouse, uh, you see parentheses there, Yarhouse. Uh, this is kind of his conceptualization. Um, if you read Yarhouse, he's the kind of person that you learn a lot from. You kind of like him, you're not quite sure where he stands on some things. Uh, part of that's because he's a consummate therapist. Uh, it, uh, he is there uh, to help create symptom relief. Uh, he puts his beliefs in the background as much as possible. Um, but what he's done a lot of work with is folks who experience uh, same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria uh, and are evangelical Christians. And so, hey, your faith and your experiencing experience regarding gender and sexuality seem to be intention. Let's help you navigate and come to understand those things, honoring both. Yet, um, and at times, different conclusions you reach, you're like, ah, there's times when he seems to very much be an evangelical. Uh, there's times when he very much seems to be just letting the experience of the individual be in front. Uh, and so if you look at his stuff, 
Um, it, my guess is you're going to have a mixed uh, emotional experience uh, with his overall literature. Um, what I want to do here uh, is simply give us an aspect of what he has said that I think helps us have the same conversation at the same time. Um, so in the experience of gender dysphoria, uh, he says there's kind of three sets of lenses that we can look at this issue from. And these represent three different questions uh, that we could ask um, about the experience of gender dysphoria. Uh, so the integrity lens uh, is the one that just says, what did God create? What did, what did God design? Uh, what, what did God intend uh, when it comes to gender? Uh, so the integrity lens starts in Genesis 1. God created them, man and woman, male and female. Um, that um, the, um, you know, if we look at this, again, if we want to study biology, uh, that uh, gender is not just a matter of genitalia. Uh, XX or XY on the chromosomes are in every cell of the human body. And so, um, in the uh, integrity paradigm, um, that's what did God intend? How do we best honor God's created design? Um, would be the driving question. Um, then you have uh, the, the disability lens. Uh, and that's one that he'll probably have to rename about a dozen times over the next uh, decade or so, uh, just because any language that you use in this area, um, it can be received for a certain period of time and then it becomes off-putting. Um, but the idea here is, this is hard. You're confused. There's a sense of disorientation here. Um, that just picking a gender and living that way and dressing that way doesn't resolve the fact that this is a hard experience. And like any other challenge in life that we face, we can we can do whatever it takes to face, face that challenge well, but it's still hard. That, uh, you know, a student who, um, in terms of information processing, experiences dyslexia, uh, they can learn to study. Uh, they can learn uh, approaches to reading that helps offset uh, that particular challenge um, still takes more energy and effort. And if there's not some sympathy for what is hard, um, then, you know, the attitude of, you know how to study now, just do it, you'll make the grade. There's going to be some interpersonal angst this says, is that really the way that you, is that all I get for the rest of my life? Um, and so, what did God intend? Uh, is it hard? Um, the third lens uh, of diversity, where do I belong? Who are my people? This is why bathrooms and locker rooms become such a big deal. That, you know, there's plenty of times when we divide up by groups. Hey, if we're doing middle school something, sixth graders over here, seventh graders over here, eighth graders over there. Um, 
you know, if it's PE class, give me my baseball players, my basketball players, my football players, my soccer players, um, hobbies, interests, school. Hey, if you're math and science minded over here, uh, give me more of my words, English uh, people over here, uh, musicians over there. Um, I mean, hey, boys and girls, divide up. Which group do I go to? Who do I belong with? Um, that hey, let's let's divide up by by gender and do accountability because you know doing accountability in mixed gender setting can be a little awkward and difficult. Um, you know, as we do small groups and uh, student ministry, something like that. Let's divide up uh, boys and girls, men and women. Where do I go? Who are my people? Who do I belong with? Um, and so um, that in the midst of a conversation that in um, evangelical circles uh, we tend to be very dominant and fast to the integrity lens. I'm all for that. God's created design. That's kind of where we start most conversations, especially, um, you know, uh, if we're going to fall a, a gospel paradigm, creation, fall, redemption, glorification. Uh, this is just saying like pre-fall before anything got messed up. What is it that God intended? Uh, well, that's typically where we go. And then we ask, where did it get muddled up by sin in the fall? And then uh, what can be done about it? But uh, the fact that this is where we start but then we're having a conversation with a friend and they're saying, if you're just telling me what I ought to do and you don't get that this is hard and I feel alone uh, and I start telling you how alone I feel and you're just telling me how wrong I am, we're having two different conversations that we're talking about the same thing I'm trying to tell you I love you and God has great plans for your life. And you're telling me I'm not listening. I can tell back to you everything that you just said. What do you mean I'm not listening? You said this and you said this and you said it's hard and you feel alone. What do you mean I'm not listening? What our friend would be saying is, this doesn't carry any weight with you. And you think if I accept this, it's supposed to fix that. I've tried. I mean, you talk to somebody in this kind of who grew up in church, they're coming to us because we're a Christian. Um, do you not think they've prayed for God to take this away? Not just light, flippant prayers, but like tears soaking my pillow, kind of, please God. Um, yet, that there's a good chance this person has studied this a whole lot more than we have uh, by the time that they get up the courage. When we move immediately to the right answer and we don't even acknowledge the courage that it takes to have this conversation, um, that's of being able to slow down and just say, hey, what part of this is hardest for you? I want to hear you. Not just what part, but when is it hard? What are your fears? What are the things that as you look down the road three, five, ten years from now that you wonder, will this ever be on the table for me? What are the things that 
that just feel off limits in terms of, man, when I when I hear a pastor talk, whether it's in a Bible study or a sermon, and they're like, hey, if you need prayer, come to us and just talk. And I'm like, I wish I could. If I come up and ask for prayer of what's going on inside of me, I'll blow this church up. They're not ready to hear from me. If I'm in a sermon, I'm the butt of a joke or the wrong side of a political discussion. I'm never mentioned with compassion. This church teaches like I don't even exist. Because in ministry leadership, one of the things that we've got to realize is what we're willing to mention from the pulpit is what we tell our people it's okay to struggle with in this church. If we don't mention it, you're not here. And so again, just the, some of that is the, who are my people? Like, do you even see me? Do you recognize how much courage it takes to come and talk and say, this is hard? Um, no, that doesn't change anything about God's design. I think it changes a lot in the conversation. And so, you know, one goal at the individual level is for us to have the patience to have the same conversation. And sometimes that just means we need, we need to have some categories. Because uh, if our friend is coming to us and they're not going to come with an outline, they're going to come with a block. And if they're coming to us in the role of being one who would be a helper, you know, if we just said, you know, I hear, I hear at least three conversations in what you're sharing with me. One, you're just asking me questions of like, what does God want? What is God's design? Secondly, you're wanting to talk through this is hard and how do I navigate it? And another conversation is you're just saying you feel alone and like there's nobody you can talk. At that moment right there, this person feels safe. Like I can, if if we're willing to have all three of those conversations, and it's not like they sort easy. They kind of bleed into one another. Um, but if we can say, hey, if can we just ask, how many people do you have that you can talk to right now? Because being alone makes anything heavier. There's nothing that haunts you like a secret. I mean, most of us in this room are old enough. We've had some kind of secret before. We did something. We didn't want mom, daddy, boss, man, somebody to find out about it. And then whoever that person is, we say, hey, can we talk? And there's that rut row reflex that says, oh, no, do you know? Whatever the nature of the relationship is, what the word of um, commendation that would come from it, whether it's a parent saying, I love you, or a boss or supervisor saying, I'm proud of you. Um, it, we hear that and we think, would you if you knew? Yet, that's the pain of this. If we just say, hey, how many people do you feel like you can talk to and uh, this doesn't immediately become a political discussion about bathrooms? Yet, 
people can you talk to and they really see you and they don't start thinking through um, liability and Twitter stories? Man, I think if we get two or three people that just, they could be your bad day phone calls. I think that'd change a lot. Because if I got nobody like that and you talk about uh, no matter what happens up here, the church is going to be God's family for me. Oh, no. Don't tell me I got to keep my junk a secret and that the church is going to be God's family for me. That's a pretty dysfunctional family. But, meet me here. Not by changing the plumbing of the church. But just by giving me a couple of friends that I don't have to be fake with. I can buy a little more of that. Step into this space where, you know, we start to ask, what kind of theological categories capture this area right here? It's the category of suffering. You know, the fall didn't just create sin. Yes, at the fall, we all became fundamentally broken and experienced the condition of sin uh, that expresses itself through particular actions of sin uh, that are in need of forgiveness for any eternal hope. Yes, praise God and amen. It also created the experience of suffering where all of creation is just groaning. Things that are marred and broken and messed up would be made like they were intended to be again. And so in the same way that, again, parallels are different here, don't hear apples to apples, but that kid who's diabetic who just gets tired of poking their finger and keeping up with sugar monitors and uh, can't engage in sports the way that they want to without always having to be called over to the sideline and we're like bud I know it's hard but there is a compassion that we bring towards that experience of suffering because we don't view the disheartedness of that emotional disruption as sin. I mean, at that moment, we're probably not looking at the kid going, Bud, you know, the Bible says be anxious for nothing. It seems like you're a little tore up about the number of times i got to uh, uh, prick your finger. You need to repent. Yeah. Ah, this is hard. In heaven, they won't have glucose monitors. Um, yet, there is an encouragement to bear up under well. Now, if the kid takes his glucose monitor and stomps on it and says, I'm not doing it, then we make a little sterner appeal because at this point, what the kid's doing is going to put himself in greater hardship. we engage with somebody here, make room for that conversation, the conversation's here. We can have those and they don't come across as gotcha statements. That, you know, we can look at other studies that just say the suicide rate on the other side of uh, gender transition surgeries they go up a lot. That doesn't mean you're not hurting. That just means that the answer that you may be looking towards is probably not the panacea that it's made out to be. That, uh, again,
again, one of the parallels that Yar House makes that, um, that I think is strong. And this is where when you get into the uh, clinical field, I think even the term dysphoria is eventually going to be one uh, that begins to come under uh, scrutiny. Because uh, if we were to ask what other uh, clinical diagnoses fit under the category of dysphoria, it would be things like anorexia. I have an unhealthy and inaccurate perception of my body. It, uh, and then, you know, what your house um, would say is, I think we've got a whole lot of people looking at gender reassignment surgery, uh, like somebody who struggles with anorexia looks at liposuction. This is reinforcing a, dis a distortion in perception. It's not correcting a problem. We're, well, one, we're never going to win that argument from a stage. If you've got an audience of hurting people and you're making this as some kind of like strong evangelistic appeal, uh, the People don't tend to move on this kind of issue in a rally. Uh, it's going to happen in a conversation. And it is understanding uh, and connection here. This is okay, you get me enough that what would be helpful, I'm willing to hear you out on that. And so at one level, uh, our goal here is just to be able to have the same conversation, have it <coughs> one conversation at a time to divide it out enough that we can get on the same page. Uh, at the church level, is to have the conversation sooner. I alluded to this earlier, uh, but I think one of the things that that really gets in our way of doing effective ministry in this area. Uh, it goes back to what we were saying of, if I don't hear my struggle in the sermon, I think I don't exist here. And so what happens? You have somebody at about that uh, stage where puberty is on setting, and whether it's unwanted same-sex attraction, whether it is a confused relationship with my gender, that well road reflex goes off. I mean, they, I'm not sure I'm experiencing life the way everybody else is. I mean, middle school is generally that experience that none of us want to go back and do again. Um, you know, if the years of life that you enjoy most are sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, you're probably not going to be very successful in life. Uh, that's what I tell my boys all the time. Don't worry about winning middle school because the people who win in middle school don't win at the rest of life. Uh, they're just the snarky punks who are able to put people down. Uh, that's the skill set that wins there. It doesn't serve you well anywhere else. Lose middle school, win the rest of life. Um, but uh, we're kind of plain spoken. I'm from Kentucky. Um, but we hit that season. We're like, I'm not sure I'm doing life the way everybody else is. Nobody talked to it. Silence. High school. Silence. I'm in a church for a decade. No outlet. Never mentioned. Not even the list of things when the preacher's coming up with everything that he can come up with the, that you might be struggling with. This doesn't even make any of the list. Just as the quick little one-off lines that we do in a um, youth group study or a sermon. I get to college. Who are the first people that will have a real conversation with me? It's the LGBT folks on campus. 
They're the first ones who will hear me, who acknowledge that I exist, who seem to care and understand and have sympathy towards number two and three there at the bottom of the board. And then when I get the courage to finally talk about it in a larger setting, Yet, too often, what is it that the church says? You're just being shrill. You need to, even if you're going to think that way and feel that way, keep it to yourself. And that's the point where people say, I'm just done with the church. You gave me no outlet for communication for this period of time. I finally find some people to care. And then your description for that is me being shrill and wrong. If we're not having the conversation sooner, we're going to think, I don't get why you're so defensive. I don't get why you're so angry and upset with us. What did we ever do to you? And they go, like, that, you just don't get it. Um, and so, I think when we begin to realize, ah, this is what it looks like to begin to just have some of the same conversation, not to compromise here, but to help somebody feel heard and known so that we can go here. And if that isn't happening sooner, if we're waiting until major life decision season of life, to begin that conversation where it feels like, um, you know, that's like getting to be second semester high school senior and then asking, where do I think I want to go to college? Um, I mean, you're just bumping up against that point in life where a lot of decisions are being made. Um, and so, um, for our friends who are already a part of our church, that would say this isn't something that I'm choosing this isn't something I'm doing for attention this is an unwanted experience do you even know I'm here Are you willing to acknowledge my presence? If I had a conversation with you, could we talk about, not that they know that this exists at multiple levels, but could we talk about this at multiple levels? It, um, so, uh, that's, that's the gist. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes and the hallways are gonna start to fill up with people who are transitioning from one spot to another. Um, yes. Thank you, this is really, really good. What would you recommend for how we should address these issues with those who are unbelievers and in the LGBT community and they're proud about their lifestyle but when they see us, they just see us as Christian haters. Mm -hmm. like how do I have the conversation with them or not? Or I start from the biblical, I start from where well, I don't have a biblical connection mm -hmm. to go from. How do you recommend to have this sort of conversation with that? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. It is coming from a different angle of where I was coming from. So the just to contrast those two, not that one good, one bad. The gist I was coming at is um, that how do we at an earlier stage so that fewer people get from our church to that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, your question is more, that clock is already ticked. Um, we're here. Um, that, um, and, you know, 
here there's a lot of motivation to have the conversation. Like this is my faith, this is where I belong, Christian people are good people, I want to be good people, uh, my life's not matching up with this. Uh, by the time we get over here, there's not a lot of motivation and Christians are the bad people. Right. Um, and, uh, again, we're talking co-worker, we're talking fellow student in school, that kind of thing. Um, it, I think we start by listening, not by talking. Hey, what's your experience been like? I... I mean, most of us can just look at Twitter uh, and have enough that we go, there's some stuff there that I can cringe for. I may not cringe as much as my friend cringes about what's there, um, but, I mean, Twitter's not a friendly place. Um, as I hear what's been hard for them, I can sympathize with that. People can disagree with your lifestyle. They've got no business treating you that way. Because um, at one level, this person is trying to decide, are you a reasonable, safe person to talk to? Um, and this is the problem with masses to masses communication. You identify with one particular population and that population can do no wrong. Um, you defend them because you agree with a certain base of ideas that they're a part of and whatever jerkish thing that they do uh, just becomes okay because they're more right uh, than the group that they disagree with. Um, well, that's an ideologue. Nobody wants to be vulnerable with an ideologue. And so that question of just, hey, if, if you don't mind, what are some of the really hard things you've experienced from people like me? It's probably going to come hot. Um, and the vocabulary may be spicy. Um, but, um, you know, to be able to say that was hard. And that was out of line. And that person may not say it, but on behalf of somebody who wants to honor Christ, I would just say the way they treated you did not honor Christ. And in some ways what you're looking for is the first genuine question. Like when I become a person you can talk to all right, well, here's what I want to know about you Christians. How is it that you can say this and this? Okay, well, now they, by me showing myself reasonable, um, I just got a question that we can meaningfully engage on. Um, it... So, uh, a tangent off of that, this is probably still a little bit more towards the, this end of the spectrum because this is kind of where my heart and passion has been. Uh, when it comes, and I'll give it this way and then I'll try to tie it in that way. When it comes to this and talking to children, so anywhere in that elementary, middle, high school age, when these kinds of topics become intensely political topics, when a child asks us a question, we tend to give them our world answers instead of helping them navigate their world. And so the answer that we give is, how do you navigate the world of somebody who's this tall, not somebody who's this tall? It, uh, and so this is where, uh, when we first start talking to our kids about sex, uh, they're much less worried about uh, how reproduction works, the birds and bees and all that kind of stuff. It's much more about 
what body parts are somebody going to ask me if I know what one is and whether I have one and I'm going to get made fun of if I don't know the right answer. That's the world of somebody this tall. <clears throat> the goal of any conversation like this is not the first conversation, it's the second, third, and fourth conversation. The way that I have the first conversation determines whether I'm going to have any of the others. And so, again, I've got two boys when we're initially having that conversation. I'm like, look, they're going to ask you if you have one of these. If you say yes, they're going to laugh at you. Here's what's going on. This is the... That's helpful. I will come to you with more conversations. Um, the win of an awkward conversation is that this person will come back to me. If we're coming over here and saying, hey, yeah, I am used to having a theologically top-down conversation where we kind of move from creation, fall, redemption, kind of we've got somebody who's taking that journey with us. I am now talking to someone that I'm helping them navigate their world. Their world is a world of hurt, mistrust, confusion, yeah. This will probably have to be our wrap up piece here, but when we think of it this way, um, you know, one of the more painful experiences of life is divorce. Um, it, uh, there's a thriving ministry, uh, divorce care, maybe at many of your churches, uh, great ministry. A topic that right now, to my knowledge, is just not even getting touched, gay divorce. If we stop and we ask the question bottom up for a minute, I think gay divorce is more uh, painful than heterosexual divorce. Because usually when there's a straight wedding, everybody's there to celebrate. You're not losing any family or friends. Nobody's cutting you off. You think about oftentimes the number of sacrifices, the number of cut off relationships, the sense in which this was part of a, a civil rights movement. This is a statement about society. That's the lens through which it's seen. How much that when this is okay that I think the world's going to be like it should be? How much hope gets placed on that relationship? I mean, in a heterosexual context, I mean, how much hope gets placed on marriage? Like, I hope Jesus comes back, but not until I get married. Uh, kind of mentality that we tend to have towards those things. But there's, like, that experience if this relationship fails, the devastation, who. Who's going to care or go, see, told you that was wrong. Um, that for that friend, this is the kind of position. That's what they are navigating. Um, it, I don't think it means we have to change anything here that there, there's one level at which we're, we're kind of saying to our friend of, I'm totally okay if you're my openly gay friend, if you're okay with me being your openly Christian friend. Can we have a conversation at that level of mutual respect? Um, that when it's your heart driving the conversation, we talk about it from the bottom up. When you're asking me questions, I'm going to do my best to join you, but there's going to be times when I talk this through from the top down, just visually here in the way that we're on the board. Um, and, you know, as we 
acknowledge whatever hardship our friend has been through, uh, if they say, I'm just not okay with you being my openly Christian friend. We're not the one being closed-minded. And I think we just look for a way to respectfully say, hey, I, I'm not asking you to set aside what you believe to talk with me. It feels like you're asking me to set aside what I believe. Uh, I, until we can both openly talk about where we're coming from, um, it's probably better if we push pause on this. And we, we don't compromise here, but we recognize I don't get to tell you how to live your life. Um, and again, with someone who, if they're in more of that activist bent, you know, um, if, if it would be their uh, disposition to take a picture of themselves holding a sign at a gay pride parade and posting it on Instagram. Um, that's probably not the friend that's going to engage with us uh, at that level. For somebody who that's not the majority experience. Um, who misses a lot of their faith, who wrestles with questions, they'll be the one that, uh, that would let us do that. So, um, good questions. You ask questions. I don't ever give short answers. Uh, that is uh, one of my shortcomings. Uh, hopefully, um, you know, if I had to guess at the experience uh, for you being here, uh, I'll say this, then we'll pray. Um, it, it may be a little frustrated. I didn't give you as many answers uh, as you wanted. Kind of clear this and that, um, and here's what you say. Uh, if people won't accept this, then just walk away. Um, that, I get it. I like answers and directives. Um, if that's what you wanted, there's a little bit of frustration. If, on the other hand, it's more, I wanted to be able to engage more fruitfully. I don't want to compromise this, but I don't want to feel like the conversation is all or nothing from the second or third exchange of what goes on. You got a little bit of a roadmap um, and a lot of curiosity from there. But let's pray, uh, and then you're off to another section. Lord, we, um, we thank you for your goodness. Uh, we thank you for your created design, the wisdom, the beauty, um, just the majesty of it. Lord, we acknowledge that all of our lived experience is off of that. Uh, we are fallen and broken, and that impacts us. Uh, each in a variety of ways. Uh, for our friends, uh, that, uh, that brokenness um, expresses itself in the area of gender and sexuality. We pray that uh, you would help us be good ambassadors of yours. Uh, that um, that there wouldn't be compromise at the level of integrity of what you made. Uh, for gender and sexuality to be, but that there would be uh, compassion and a place of belonging when it comes to uh, just things being hard and wanting a group that can be my family and my people uh, that, um, Lord, that you would help us be both theologically accurate uh, and interpersonally effective. Lord, if you'd take this time and move us a step in that direction, uh, that would be that would be wonderful. In your name, we pray. Amen.